so what we're given I'm, I'm always like over explaining my work but I feel like I should at least tell you what the book is about um I'm really obsessed with with two things I'm obsessed with relationships and with people and how the, the effect that they have on us and I'm also super interested in lineage but I think we have a habit of looking at lineage and what we inherit as kind of like a a vertical process and it's one that we arrive at and it's already happened and we're not present in it um and I'm really interested in lineage looking at it horizontally something that we're very much active in um and instead of just looking up and back at how you became who you are looking to the side of you at who is there with you um and and kind of how they became who they are and how that influences who you are um so this is basically what that's about in a nutshell um the first poem i'm going to read is actually the first poem in the book and i feel like it kind of just sums it up so it's called uh, everyone i love is capable of dying everyone i love is capable of dying and i am in love with this fact how unflinching it is how lucky I am to be able to prepare for at least one abandonment. Nothing is sexier than the prospect of being left and the dead do leaving so well. Love's appeal is in its propensity to end in heartbreak. What you can do before that is magical. Eat mango from the navel of a woman who will break you. Romance someone in the frozen food aisle. What is love for if not ruining basic experiences alongside someone else? I want to love someone so hard I can barely be without remembering them. Um, so I'm going to like in the book there, everything is kind of like non-linear and split up. But for the like sake of having a cohesive and coherent set, I have um, like grouped the poems and that's how I read them. So a lot of the poems are about motherhood and my relationship with my mum. My mum is an alcoholic and my mum's mum had problems with addiction. And um, it kind of struck me while I was writing this that I think in my family, we have a tendency to think of each family unit as its own individual event. So I think my mum saw her relationship with her mum as an individual happening and then her relationship with me as something separate without kind of identifying the thread that linked us all together. Um, so one day she was like, and I think that kind of insular, not looking outwards really affects how you react and how you form a relationship with your family. Um, so I wrote this poem after one day my mum was like, I'm going to do a DNA test because I think I'm part Spanish. And I was like, that's absolutely not the case. <laughs> um, so it wasn't the case, spoiler alert. Um, but this is called, Who Can I Blame For The Legs That I Have? DNA test confirms you are 98% Irish, 2% Northern European. It does not tell you who felt the grape split under their bare foot first. Cannot trace the wine back to its bloodline. Bring you a great, great grandmother held like a baby swaddled in origin. All our women are midwifing. At wakes. Tending to excuses. There are things about you I cannot stop. A bruise spreading wrist to elbow, fresh ink on the page of the body. The folded corners of sobriety, how the blood embraces the cotton, the Catholicism of alcoholism. Our own children cannot prevent us from becoming our mothers. Um, so like I said, there's like a, a kind of history of addiction in my family um, and this poem is about that kind of cyclical nature of relapse and getting clean and relapse and what that looks like um, in like a familial context um, so this is called a little amnesia 
How many times can a story repeat itself until they have to get new actors in? You aren't allowed to break confidentiality. Now it's so you bring me to the source. Nowadays you smell undone like wet flour. There is mascara under your eyes for a second. You could be a bird trapped in an oil spill rather than an addict in a community center. I want to be able to write what saves you. I am building you a labyrinth and drawing the map too. I am asking you to follow me, know your way out. All the advice is at odds with each other. I'm supposed to love you into pre-purged porcelain, little crystal figurines so polished, I can almost see myself in you. I'm supposed to leave long enough that you have to get sober just to be sure that this is real. Um, so I'm gonna do a poem now. Um, thank you. <laughs> it's, really, it's really weird reading. Um, and then just like, <laughs> like just going straight into the next poem. Um, but you're all very sweet. I'm not looking at the little messages, which makes me feel a lot less like I'm on an MS Teams call at work. Um, so this poem is about my brother. And it's a bit more cheerful. Um, my brother is like my best pal. He's a fucking pain in the ass, but he is probably my best pal. Um, and he is uh, severely developmentally and physically disabled. So he's technically considered um, nonverbal which if you've ever met him, um, he's not, he never, ever, ever shuts up, but he is, it's a language that isn't our own. And so it's not considered correct. And I think my relationship with my brother really formed my love of language and, and communicating. Um, but I was always really like reticent to write a poem about him because I was like, how do I center someone in a piece of work that will never be able to understand it. How do I kind of put him at the forefront of something that he can't play an active part in? Um, so this is kind of what that poem's about, but mostly when I was writing it, I wanted it to sound a certain way when I read it out loud. So the sounds, he can make certain sounds better than he can make other sounds. Um, and the B sound is one of them, and the S sound is another, although it's a lot more like lispy when he does it. There's a lot more like spit involved, um, which I'm not gonna do. So this poem is called Poem for My Brother, as in open mouth dream, sweet as maple syrup and twice as difficult. Language is its own kind of cruelty, and I want to invite you halfway to here. Listen, 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 be the lounging lizard if you like. I'll be the hot tropic sun, the baked concrete slab beneath your belly. Keep bending if that's best. I'll break the rules for you. Redefine speech until it's a silver noise settling in its sentiment. Soft jawed superhero. I'll make the world play the incomprehensible one. We can bask in all you know and how you say it, dueling the air, tongue, wet and perfect as jade. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this poem is a bit different. Um, my dad died when I was younger and it's always really fascinated me how, um, people from like all walks of life, from like people I know and people I meet all the way to like medical professionals and mental health professionals see the absence of a father figure and the absence of a man as having a more profound effect on me than the presence of the women in my life. Um, and this poem is basically a, about the conversation I have every single time I'm referred to a different service for mental health, where they're like, tell me about yourself. And as soon as I say my dad's dead, they're like, fucking told you. Um, so this is called um, D is for dead, no, dad. All therapists' offices look the same. 
Same blue chair to stick to in the summer, thighs young and unforgivable. Same woman sitting in front of you, same voice, same school, same questions, same training. Dad, dead. And she says, oh, desire. And I say, no, dead. And she says, detriment, damaged, destructive, destroyed. She says, difficult, dead. And she says, oh, denial. And I say, no, dead. And she says, dull, declining, derailed, damned. She says, drowning, dead. And she says, oh, directionless. And I say, no, dead. And she says, different, devastating, dysfunctional, debilitating. She says, despairing, dead. And she says, oh, dear. Um, so this poem is about, there is a, other than my brother, there's like basically like four men in my life that I will allow rights. Um, and <laughs> it's my brother and it's also my uncle. Um, so this poem is called My Uncle Can't Dance. So I have to say if I was like anyone in my family the most, it would be my uncle, um, which is kind of weird if you see us together because he's like, six foot tall and about 22 stone and I'm five foot three and not 22 stone and he is also like incredibly like logic based he is like solution based if you're feeling any kind of way if you have any kind of problem he's like we're gonna fix it and I'm the opposite of that in that I'm like I'm just gonna feel it I'm gonna feel all the time um but he and I are very similar in lots of different ways in that we both have a savage temper. Um, he taught me basically not to let anyone take me for a dickhead, um, which is a trait I'm pretty pleased with. Um, and this poem is about a specific moment, so I'm touching later on in the book and also in my set um, about a bereavement that I experienced at the beginning of the year. Um, I lost one of my best friends, um, but also my ex-girlfriend. And when I heard the news that she'd passed away, I called my uncle, who was the first person that I called. And he said, um, okay, well, I'll meet you at the station. Somehow he's always like two minutes away from me. Um, and he's like, cool, I'll come and meet you at the station. And he didn't ask me anything. He didn't say anything to me because I think he knew I couldn't speak. And instead he just held my hand. Um, even when he changed the gear on the car, he didn't let go of my hand. He just did it with like the bottom of his palm. Um, and then after a while he was like, do you wanna go and get something to eat? And I was like, should probably do that. And we occupied this weird space between the rest of my life and the life that I had before that loss. And it was like, I know what's waiting for me, but I haven't stepped foot in it yet. Um, and this poem is about my uncle and basically how he's always like two minutes away to rescue me from whatever situation I've got myself into. And it's called My Uncle Can't Dance. If you hold your fist like that, you'll break your wrist or your thumb. Come. Let's move through the day like engine oil. In the front seat of the car is a lacquer for you. The bag is going gray from white with the goodness of it. My uncle watches me take it apart with my hands so he can be sure of at least one thing I've eaten today. Skinny cunt, he says. Fat bastard, I reply, steam rising when I laugh. My uncle is work calloused in summer, the colour of old light leather. Doesn't talk a lot, but still has the presence of a boot through a frozen lake, all the birds fleeing their nests as it happens. My uncle can't dance, but is always driving to somewhere or back from it. Somehow never more than five minutes away when I call all of him enormous and silent beside me, driving home from the hospital or therapy. At the traffic lights, I make a brand new fist to show him. Better, he says. Better. Um, so my uncle was like, I don't like poetry. 
we were like walking around Waterstones one day. I'm pretty sure I was like dragging him around there. And he just turned to me and he was like, Liv, I hate it. I hate poetry. And I was like, oh. So I sent him this and he was like, I am going to make it my WhatsApp homepage. And I was like, I don't know what a WhatsApp homepage is, but thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so I think that's all I'm going to do. I don't know how long I've been chatting shit for. Um, but the... Fern, how long do I have left? <laughs> Ollie, you've got as long as you want. Just keep going. We're loving it. <laughs> um, so another thing that I touch on in the... That's kind of like the family stuff. Obviously, there are more poems, but I don't want to read you the whole book. Um, and the other stuff that I touch on is, um, is sexuality. So somewhat surprisingly, maybe to some of you... Um, is that I only came out as a man hating dyke like halfway through last year. Um, and I know that anyone who's interacted with my social media is like fucking hell, I wish you didn't bother, like please shut up. Um, but I did only come out last year, but I had a really weird like non-linear process with the closet. Um, so my first relationship, my longest relationship, and my first love was with a woman. And when we broke up, I couldn't, fathom how I was going to go around and be unavailable to men. It seemed incomprehensible to me. Um, I was never ashamed of the fact that I liked women, but not liking men was like this like other world that I couldn't imagine living in or existing in. Um, but because I was out as bisexual, um, I spent a lot of time in like gay places. Um, but what would happen is that I would go and a woman would look at me and I would just become completely unraveled, which is not unlike what happens now. But then I would go home and I would like feel this like deep, unshakable shame and disgust. And then when the Orlando nightclub shooting happened, it was like I couldn't understand how people who were out there and brave enough to be authentically themselves and to go out of an evening and to dance and exist and be in love could end up being shot. And I, I think it, it really stayed with me to the point where even now, if I go out to a club or I go and meet someone in that kind of space, um, it crosses my mind. I think of those people and I think of the fact that that happened. So this poem was written shortly after that and it's called The Choir. I could make this mean anything. If there's a cure, let me have it. The way the dance floor floods with sunrise sometimes. How I would roll my sleeves up, but there are still whole lives under there and you are still beautiful. I'm brushing a stranger's hair off my shoulder. Someone is wearing your perfume. I'm in reverse. Everyone here is dancing the same way those 49 people died. If the knife kissed a little to the left, we would all be dead. We hold our weddings where we can also hold our wakes. Call this ceremony, call it tradition, call this what it is. Do you remember the oil fire? The bath over running how fast you can unhold a hand when you have to. Wasn't this supposed to be beautiful? Um, so like I said, the poems are, my process with coming out the closet was very unlinear and I wanted to mirror that in the way that the poems occur on, um, in the book. So the poem just before this is a lot happier and it's called The Old Dyke Takes Me to My First Gay Bar. Um, <laughs> um, so The Old Dyke Takes Me to My First Gay Bar. Shows me how to hold my back as straight as I can manage. Someone like me, someone like us, here in the dark undertongue of Soho. I'm 17 and the air is wet with the women in it shows me how to curve my mouth a little. 
how not to quiver when a hand finds itself just above my secret palm flat against my back. The old dyke looks like everyone in here has loved her at some point, lucky to have done so, stained silk under the low light knows how to breathe in time with the music. The old dyke doesn't flinch when the world says she should. Outside, the old dyke shows me how to light a woman's cigarette while it's still in her mouth. Passes down to me a hundred ways of knowing without ever having to ask her. Um, so yeah, that, that's a more, a happier poem. Um, and then I'm going to do, <laughs> I'm really conscious of who's on the call. This is Fern's favourite, so I'm going to do it. It's called The Series of Truths. Um, and I'm going to get my paraphrasing mallet out now. I'm just going to absolutely ruin this. But Andrew McMillan has this really gorgeous poem. Um, and it's called Inheritance. And it looks at how intimacy and sex is actually a story a story that someone tells us and that we go on to tell someone else. Like, people will do things to us that we will be like, that was great, and we'll go and do it to someone else. Um, which, in theory, sounds really lovely, and I can, like, objectively be like, wow, isn't that gorgeous? And then um, sometimes I'm like, <laughs> the, like, inner princess comes out, and I'm like, the absolute fucking audacity that this person that I love has had to love someone before me and to touch them on top of that is disgraceful and unforgivable. Um, and this is, this is that poem. If I think too hard about the fact you learned to fuck me like that from someone else, I get upset. I stay in the bath until I'm wrinkled because I want my back to be the first back you've ever licked and I can't make it so. If I get out now, I'll be upset with no right and you'll be perfect in the kitchen light like marble if marble were liquid. Each time you call me greedy, your gums come out. The same shade secret flesh always is. Pink as a new day. And I know what you mean is for me, but I'm still going to pout about it. Until you come over. Hook your thumbs round my waist. Suddenly I'm vulnerable as an upturned fish. A summons soft underbelly. And for a second, I can believe everyone else was just a warm up. A test run that we simply had no time to waste with each other. Um, so that was my like, bratty poem. Um, so I'm going to read one more gay one, because why not? Um, yay! <laughs> um, so I spent this New Year's Eve, okay, I'm going to read two, I'm going to read two. Um, this one is called Gay Chicken, actually. So when you're like a big dyke and you're growing up as a girl, <laughs> as a girl it's really easy to like slide under the radar because girls are always making out with each other. And I don't know why straight girls do this, right? I like, I don't know what's in it for them, but I knew what was in it for me. And I was like this, I'm having a great time. This is really great. Um, and there's this game that used to be played all the time and it was called Gay Chicken. And it was basically where two people of the same sex, and I'm pretty sure no boys were playing this game. Two people of the same sex, who could get closest to the other one to like the point of kissing without like backing away. Um, and that, then you'd be the chicken. Um, I was never the chicken. <laughs> and this is a poem <laughs> about that, like that experience when you're young and like, yeah. I remember being like, when I was really young, I was like a real tomboy and all the girls would be like, oh, I really want to paint your nails. And I'd be like, oh, okay. And then like holding my hands and I'd be like, wow, this is the absolute best day of my life. Um, so this bone's called Gay Chicken, actually. Young and without the right processes for desire, every gathering inevitably ended in a game of chicken. A test of now. Who could get closest to the other before bottling? I was the best. 
the bravest, met the lips of each friend unflinching, their laughter splitting the evening wide open. Safe in the permission of symmetry, I became a place to place wanting. I was always brushing their hair but cutting my own. Every dare sent in my direction until our bodies outgrew the excuses we'd given them. So we tried on new disguises. It's not what you think. Girls are different. We can do this with each other. Um, so the last one I'm going to read about being a dyke is called Etymology of Dyke. Um, and it's pretty self-explanatory, so you don't have to bother listening to the preamble this time. The joke starts with two girls smoking a cigarette the safest way for their mouths to share a space. Both of them returning home, nicotine thick, on their fingers little intimacies, close as a bird's feather to its breast. The joke starts with two girls closing their eyes when they dance. At one point I was underage even if I never felt it, disappearing my angles into warm red wine becoming boundaryless in some sticky, flawed abyss. The joke starts with two girls on a nameless train, perfumed, perched, wet and sculpted as cliff face, knees barely touching, each stranger a god with its eyes open. The joke starts with two girls not saying anything, fruit fly escaping a pair of clapped hands, threats in peripheral vision are closer than they appear, milk curdling in an antique teacup. The joke starts with two women walking into a bar, unsure of how not to love one another. Risk, noun, a situation involving exposure to danger, two women walking into a bar, two women walking into a joke starts with two women never ends. Um, so yeah, thanks. That's the, that's kind of the gave it done for now. Um, so I mentioned earlier, um, at the beginning of the year, I lost my ex-girlfriend, um, and one of my best friends. Um, and I think like I was talking about that kind of pre grieving space that I was in in that poem about my uncle I can very much think about my life as kind of pre Talia getting sick and post Talia getting sick um and obviously you know we she really made me think about lineage because we were together all through my like formative years um in that like all-consuming unending first love kind of love um and when she got sick I used to dream all the time um that she had passed away and I would wake up and and you're kind of crazy in this in this period and I would be like oh my god well if I'm dreaming this I'm I'm gonna make it happen I'm, I'm somehow gonna like manifest this happening so what I would do is I would wake up and I'd have this dream and I wouldn't tell her but I would send her a text or I would call her to like make sure that, that I hadn't somehow like willed that into into happening um and this is one of the few poems in the book so Tao never let me write anything and not show her um like I could like post like half a word on my Instagram story and Tally would be there in like 60 seconds being like, let me see. Um, and this is one of the few poems in the book that she kind of got to see before, um, before she passed away, which is, um, which is very nice to have. Um, and it's called, Oi, when you get this, call me please. One more dream in which she has already died, so I am repentant upon waking. A text just to see her read it. An excuseless phone call to cleanse a premature grief. Memories are their own kind of affirmation. 
I watch a home video, her mouth laughing into the shape of her sister's eyes and her sister's name, eyes already making promises. Before I know the hospital has a ban on flowers, something about germs or the inevitable fate of each bunch, I'm making small talk with the florists. Want to ask about funerals without committing myself to a future. Sometimes I fear I'll think something enough times that it becomes true. So I consider all the hours we spent undeniably alive, adolescent, salt and milk and metal, elbow deep in the fire, bare-backed, unruly and unrepentant and unblinking. Until the dream is just a splinter in the hand that holds us significant until it isn't um and then the next poem that i have on the list to read i like put down the page numbers ah um so this is called somewhere all the other gods are laughing at us um and i wrote this by this point um like tal wasn't really able to like make any contact um and it was kind of just imagining what i would do what i could do um and i think it was uh, somewhere all the other gods are laughing at us because i'm very much like oh I don't, I don't believe in god um but grief makes you do crazy things and i'm putting her fucking birth crystal in my pillowcase i'm saying you know, reciting things to the moon. Um, and that's a form of prayer. So um, looking at, at how, yeah, this is called somewhere all the other gods are laughing at us. But if we don't pray, who will? Nowadays, our poems are less like poems, more just statements of fact. If you say something enough times, it becomes true. One, your name was not your name until your mother said it so and watched you dance to it. Two, our hands can hide the sun. Yes, even from down here can protect our pale faces. These tiny things. Our personal planet. Maybe holy is what you need so we will resurrect the church. Measure the space from miracle to miracle. In my next life, I'm coming back to you, slow as sugar water, spark of small joy, body of the banyan tree. Um, so this one is a little bit, is that is a little bit cheerier. <laughs> um, but just before she passed, I lost my phone. I didn't lose it, actually. I broke my phone. Um, let this be a lesson to you all. Like, back your shit up. Put your stuff on your computer. Take it all off your fucking phone. Because I broke my phone. And with it, I lost um, all of our messages, all of our voice notes, all of the screenshots. And that, like, I can't really think about that too much because it makes me want to lose my mind. Um, but I became convinced after she passed away that I was going to forget what she sounded like. Um, the only way I can describe it is when you think of someone or something enough times, it, it begins feeling like when you say a word over and over again and it stops making sense, or when you write something out and you've seen it so often and you're like, is that really how it's spelled? And I think of her and I remember her all the time to the point of being like, Oh, I almost, I almost don't remember you. I almost, what if this isn't right? What if this isn't correct? Um, and this poem is called, you know, I became obsessed with the idea that I was going to forget what she sounded like. Um, I haven't. Um, but this is called Rather Than Forgetting Her Voice. And it's pretty self-explanatory. Not that that stops me from fucking rambling on for like 20 minutes. Rather than forgetting her voice, I eat powdered sugar from a tablespoon. 
drink condensed milk straight from the tin like a cloudy sky filling my mouth. Wave to wherever she is, which I don't think is up there or down below, more like just behind me, close as the past ever is. I let the sun kiss me and I even kiss it back. It's a miracle we get to call anything ours, so I hoard all the goodness I can get my hands on, grind the day between my teeth and grin at all my friends. Not only am I in love, but I'm the best at it. Buy a dozen roses for my girlfriend saying, look, Look what I've done for you. And then the whole estate is a picnic basket. All the bus stops are strawberry punnets. And I still haven't forgotten her voice. Um, so this one, <laughs> um, just before she got sick, I was asked to read at Rap Party. Um, if you haven't been, you should go when we're not in a pandemic. Um, it's really good. You have to write in response to like a rap or a hip hop song. And then um, there's like a DJ and they'll like play like three songs of choice, whatever. So just before she got sick, I got asked to, to, to do the gig and she was like, cool, I'm gonna come. And then she got sick. Um, and I was like, well, I'm gonna write the poem for you then because me and Tal, the like short version of this story is that me and Tal met online <laughs> um, and we didn't meet for a long time like in person but we used to text like every day for like six months until we met in real life um, and one of the first things that we ever like bonded over was a love of um, like grime music, UK hip-hop, rap. Um, so this poem I wrote about Tao after the J Huss lyric. Um, they can bum my flesh, but they can't touch my spirit. Um, and then there's like in the actual book, there's two parentheses with like italic text in them, um, which are things that she said to me about her treatment. Um, and yeah, this poem is for um, in the book, it's for Sadie Italia um, and Pems. No small part of you has ever managed to be insignificant. So while with the others, it is the removal of something tangible, a newborn baby, a tangerine sized heartache, something they can shrink right down. I coming away from the microscope, how remarkable, incredible, drunk on comparison. You're threading a needle through my veins all the way into my heart. It makes sense that none of you is sacrificable. This is how I justify it. Because I want it to be easy. I want it to be so easy we laugh about it. Your eyebrow raised in the face of it. Your teeth clean from kissing them. It's almost like they don't know who you are, blood drawn is doing the needle a favour. Stubbornness begats survival, so blessed be those on the receiving end of your screw face. They are, they are drilling straight into my bone. It's almost like they don't know who you are. What's a little bit of struggle when to make it is your mother tongue? When you are Sadie, is my mother strong? It's impossible to marry you to this disease when the idea of you weak is wholly wrong. It's almost like they don't know who you are. Still catching sunlight in your clenched fists. North London princess. Have you ever seen a cherry blossom storm in Tottenham? The sun setting behind the Asda in Edmonton, beautiful in all your grit. Not in spite of it, they can bun your flesh, but they can't touch your spirit. Um, I don't know, I feel like I'm going on for ages, um, but I'm gonna like, <laughs> thank you. Um, 
I'm going to do two more and then, and then I'll shut up. Um, and what am I going to do? I haven't really thought this through. Um, I'm going to do, this one is called um, Painting the Day by Numbers. Um, there's like a load of paint names in here and I don't know how to pronounce them. I just Googled acrylic paint names. So I just make them up. Um, if you know, if you know, let me know. Um, but I don't know. Um, full disclosure there. It's going to be different every time I read this, but that's fine. Bit of brassle dazzle. I eat the acrylics making my tongue alizir and crimson instead of just red, like a tiny celebration in my mouth. And continue my day cutting the poem into couplets and checking my spam folder that is full of beautiful women who want them, who want me to show them my cock. Someone I knew as a baby, but not for much longer, posts on Facebook that in Queens, New York, they are currently keeping a refrigerated van outside Elmhurst Hospital for the dead. Which leads me to wonder where you are, if you're cold, whether your skin is a different shade than I knew it, maybe thalassine blue or Payne's gray. I hope afterwards we still recognize each other. Or maybe wear name tags so I can find you easily. Our embrace, soft as it's ever been, your face so nearly unchanged. And when I'm done with this thought, I go back to the house, asking all its chores of me. Pour the water from the vase because the flowers have already died, which would be fine, but I only bought them yesterday. So yeah, this is gonna be the last poem that I do and it's the title poem. Um, and it's, it's obviously called What We're Given, because that's the title of the book. A small pot and a plant to keep alive in it. South facing windows. Hot tarmac in the summer. Sweet corn straight from the tin. Bone aching pain and then morphine. Sex that makes the backs of our knees sweaty. Betting shops, first kisses, buses with wet top deck windows, crying in public, two magpies for joy, languages we don't speak, loads of them, prayers that feel too easy to say, crisp sandwiches, aeroplane seats with a kicking kid behind them, recipes for yellow rice, apple cake, mac and cheese, Small pride, postcodes, patients, prescriptions, perseverance, pensions, peppercorns, petulance, the alphabet, grief, it's moth dust on our fingers, pick and mix, 12 step fellowships, faithfulness, chlorine in our eyes, hot baths, half time, stomach pumps, chemotherapy. Valentine's Day, mathematics, faithlessness, impossible things, words for other words when the other words just won't do. Birthday parties, departure lounges, yearning, museums, bathroom haircuts, prime numbers, numbing cream, sports teams, poetry, one for sorrow, Terms of reference, fetishes, traffic jams, second chances, jazz bands, laboratories, labradors, lesbians. A little life in which to say we all love you so much. You can go now. It's okay. Thank you. <laughs>